Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan from the right. And I'm Dallas Jones from the left. This week on Red, White, and Blue, we're going to be talking about the Texas education system and specifically about HISD and its forthcoming takeover by the state of Texas. For that, we have the best source possible, the commissioner of the Texas Education Agency, Mike Morath. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. I call this, uh, I think Dallas agrees, kind of a report to the citizens of this area about what's going on. But the first question I want to ask you today is, what is the Texas Education Agency? What does it do? So our, um, our, the Texas Education Agency is tasked with providing leadership, guidance, and support to school systems throughout the state of Texas to improve student outcomes. Um, what that means for me personally is every day I get to wake up and think about how to help five and a half million kids, uh, which is really a phenomenal opportunity. But for us as an organization, we're focused on a set of priorities related to supporting teachers. Uh, we know that teachers are the single most important in-school factor that improves stu student outcomes. So we, we try to be relentless in our, in our work to, to recruit, support, and retain teachers and principals. I mean, the, the, uh, I, I can actually talk forever about um, supporting teachers, but we've got to be very serious about how we love on those who love on our kids. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that we do at the agency. We're also, we've got a priority related to supporting uh, foundations um, uh, of reading and math for all of our kids. When you think about young learners, can we ensure that our youngest learners have uh, mastered the fundamentals? The, the, if, if we don't, if our system isn't properly oriented to doing that in all of our schools, all 8,600 schools around Texas, then uh, gaps in, in knowledge and skills open up in kids and those gaps become very expensive to, to support later in life. So it's, it's just fundamentally much more efficient if we uh, never let the achievement gap start in the first place. Then work that we do at the high school level to ensure that all of our high schools are properly connected to what comes after high school. You think in Houston today, in Texas today, there's gonna to be some kid in some high school that raises his hand and says, teacher, when am I ever gonna use this? And so this, this work to ensure that there's relevance and, and uh, rigor in our, in our high schools for our students to prepare them for what comes next, it's, it's critical to our work. And then um, last but certainly not least, making sure that all of our schools um, provide the kind of educational opportunity that we would want for all of our kids, that, um, that our own uh, practices, our own expectations for kids are, are as high as they can possibly be. So the, the work to make sure that we can wrap our arms around our most struggling campuses to improve low-performing schools around, uh, around the state, this is, this is critical. When, when you think about public education writ large, you know, we in this country, we are we're blessed to live in a country where you have these foundational documents that speak to the highest ideals of man, that all men are created equal, that we're endowed with certain rights, the right to pursue happiness being chief among them. Our system of public education is really the deliverer of those rights. The, you know, the American dream is not for the faint at heart. And if, if, if we reach this vision of public education, that all of our schools are rigorous, that equip kids uh, for uh, modern citizenship, then we have a country that can sustain the, the democratic experiment that we've had for 200 plus years for another 200 years. But if we don't, if we, if we have pockets of schools that aren't providing that kind of opportunity for, um, for a rigorous education, then, then it means we have um, whole groups of citizens that you know won't be able to experience the same country that you and I have experienced. So, th you know, this is what we're focused on at the agency: is to make sure that the entire system, five and a half million souls in our schools, seven hundred thousand plus teachers, uh, get the support. Uh, sorry, I should say seven hundred thousand plus employees in in our our public schools around the state of Texas get the support that they need um, to ensure that every Texan is well educated. So, you know, the question I would ask is. What you know, having said all that, where are we in our mission to do these things? Where would you say um, the state of, of, of public education here in Texas is? Where are we? Yeah, so uh, I would say that there's two simultaneous stories, uh, answers to that question. One is um, an answer of continuous improvement. Uh, the, the outcomes that our, uh, our students are achieving today, whether we're looking at the percentage of high school graduates that, that finish in four years, the percentage of graduates that go on to obtain either a trade credential or 
um, uh, an associate's or bachelor's degree or enter in, into the military, these numbers are generally at all-time highs um, and earlier numbers in the systems, things like kindergarten readiness or, uh, or uh, literacy or mathematics um, knowledge in, in, the earlier, in the earlier years, they're, they're generally at all-time highs. That being said, um, the overall level of achievement still, um, still leaves a lot uh, to be desired. We, we, if you look at the most recent um, data that we have coming out of high schools in the state of Texas, looking at all high schools across the state of Texas, and you fast forward six years after um, high school graduation, what percentage would you estimate of high school kids have obtained six years later either a trade credential um, whether we're talking welding or Cisco systems engineer or something like that, or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. This is now we're talking 24 year olds coming out of, a, um, uh, out of the system um, six years afterwards. Any, any, anything you're willing to guess at what that what percentage would you guess? is? 50%? Uh, sounds, sounds good. Yeah. We so, agree. So, so <laughs> the actual number is 32%. Um, so uh, we're, that's we're, the number I was going to go so, with at first. I should have so, never agreed. Yeah, with that. <laughs> well, that's what uh, I get. The, this, <laughs> it's you know, it's important to put this in perspective. That number is in fact higher than it's ever been. Really? You know, you talk to uh, I talk to to people around the, the state all the time, and I think that that um, uh, you know there are some people that sort of reflect, and it's like, why can't it be like it was in the good old days when I, you know, when I was a kid, um, when, when the when the schools worked the way they did back then. But um, you know, we, we forget certain things, like the level of adult literacy was only about half um, uh, 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 where it is today, um, as recently as 30 or 40 years ago. The, the, um, the, our, our, our entire system of public education is focused on every child, regardless of what they look like, regardless of where they come from, whether it's the smallest rural hamlet up in the panhandle, whether it's big city Houston, anything in between, regardless of what uh, your, your family circumstances, did you, were you born into a wealthy family, were you born into um, meager means, um, uh, is a, the language that you speak at home predominantly English or not, um, are you a foster child, homeless? We actually, we, we care about all kids in our public education system, and I'm not sure that that was always the case. I, I so reflect, that's the percentages, would, would it be lower if you, since you care about everybody? That's as exactly opposed right. To, <clears throat> well, other thing that doesn't happen anymore is that corporal punishment was outlawed at schools. Yeah. Well, that's a, yeah, that's one of, one <laughs> of that, a number I don't of know changes. If that's, I'm not sure that's good or bad. I want to bring you into focus, uh, talk about Houston area. Obviously, you, Houston Independent School District has been in the news for a number of years. Uh, clearly, I think most people agree they had a dysfunctional and has had a dysfunctional uh, uh, school board for a number of years where they really couldn't agree on anything. Uh, and uh, we had a number of schools that persistently failed in HISD. So you, as, as commissioner, have taken an action here and you've made the decision, <clears throat> I guess at the behest of the governor, maybe not, you'll explain that, that HISD needs to be now be taken over by a state appointed board of managers. Is that that's pretty much describes where we're at? Uh, well, some of that's, uh, I would say, spot on. The, the, uh, the legislature passed the law, it was actually incredibly um, uh, what I would characterize as pro-student. Um, and the law says that, uh, sort of implicitly, that we want, we want to ensure that all of our schools are being supported. So if you have a, a single school in a school system that is chronically underperforming uh, for five plus years, you know, essentially two entire cycles in some cases of kids that um, have not been adequately equipped with the skills to read, write, and do math, um, if that um, happens, then the Commissioner of Education is forced to, to take action. So um, this is something that comes directly from law and um, is more or less required. The law has actually had tremendously positive effects. So you think of the number of uh, uh, multi-year, very chronically underperforming campuses in Houston or around the state. And it has, since the passage of that law, it has plummeted. We've gotten a lot better at supporting low-performing schools in the state of Texas. But Houston was unable um, to, for a variety of complicated reasons, um, solve these problems for all of their kids and all of their schools. And, and there's a number of, of campuses that in, the, in HISD that have been persistently not delivering for the kids. Yeah, there are 50 DNF campuses in Houston in total. This is more than just a one campus problem. Um, uh, and uh, there is uh, one campus that has been um, uh, underperforming um, for 
seven or eight years now. Um, uh, there were as many as 13 of these campuses. Uh, the agency actually began a gradual um, intervention process. So one of the campuses was Kashmir High School, you may be familiar with, um, which was low performing for 11 years in a row. But because that law was passed that says we're, we have to resolve um, chronic low performance and because the agency intervention sort of gradually began, uh, Kashmir is now a C. It's, it's substantially improved. Um, uh, and uh, the, be that as it may, the system as a whole is still not serving all of its kids the way that they deserve to be served. Yeah, so you, oh. so, go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you, Gary, if you don't mind. I don't so, mind. Uh, <laughs> I was going to follow up. There's a dialogue roll. going. I, I was rolling. It, it, you know, let's make it a trialogue. <laughs> um, so, um, my question is this, look, I have, I have, I've, I've known you, Commissioner, for quite some time, and I, 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 since back when you were on the Dallas Independent School Board, um, and I, I, I know you have a tremendous passion for children. We've had so many conversations uh, around that. And this show was, was extremely important uh, to all of us, but uh, you know, to have you here, to really have an opportunity, I, I, I think, to talk to um, um, the citizens of Houston, the, the, the parents of the Houston Independent School District, and allow them to hear from from your from your pers your voice your perspective about why what is going to happen is is a good thing because there's so much information out there that says well this is an attempt of you mentioned the governor to try to take over our schools and they just want to privatize our schools or charterize our schools and do those things um, you know I, I want you to to take this opportunity to really explain why this this is a good thing and 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 what what brought you to the decision that that to, to ultimately do this it is it is important that we always remain focused on why it is we do this work which is our kids I'm a parent of four young kids I was a, a big brother for 10 years and part of the big brothers big sisters program and, um, and it's incumbent upon us to move with extraordinary urgency to ensure that we are giving our kids uh, our absolute best. You, you only get one shot at first grade. And um, in Houston, because of really a series of governance failures, because of an inability for those that were, um, that were selected for the sole purpose of ensuring that the system remains focused on kids, uh, uh, because that governing body was completely unable to do that, uh, it causes chaos through, through the organization. And the, this, there's no um, number of layers in, a, in the bureaucracy of a big city school district that can protect teachers from shenanigans at the school board. I, I lived this same reality as a school board member in Dallas. So it, it, none of this work is easy, but we have to ensure that the people that are tasked, that we place our trust in to, um, to support our kids with wise decision making, that that's in fact what they're doing. And they're not arguing with each other over, over um, completely unrelated things or trying to score political points. So what we're going to do is choose uh, from a, a, a group of Houstonians um, uh, the, uh, that have stepped forward and volunteered and said, I wish to serve in this capacity. That's an important point that, that you may want to repeat, that these are Houstonians that you are putting in, in the role to manage the district, yeah, not to, outsiders from other TEA, places. TEA, it's, it's it should to be very clear, TEA is not managing the school district, not at any point in time. What we are doing um, specifically is choosing from a, a, a list of people, of essentially volunteers who have said, I wish to serve. We're providing them with uh, as much training as we can on how to govern school systems, what the role of a board is, um, how to, how to uh, support students with an appropriately uh, loving um, and rigorous uh, learning environment, how to oversee your superintendent and your leadership team at the board level, because this is a big system. Um, uh, we're, we, we work to train those folks, but we're just, we are going to select from a group of volunteers um, of, of people who live in Houston ISD that have said, I wish to serve on the school board. And you got hundreds of applicants I read in the paper. Yeah, well, well over 200 applicants um, uh, that, that have s s stood up and said, uh, you know, if, if not me, who, if not now, when? And this is what we want. We want people who are focused on kids. In fact, when we think about the process that we're going to interview, uh, we go through to interview these folks. 
you know, there's been a lot of conspiracy talk that it's about this or it's coming from the, you know, the governor or, or whomever else. But um, what, what we're actually interested in is selecting people who believe that all children can learn. That is the single most important filtering criteria. Do you believe that all children and, can learn? And this is, a, as it turns out, is a, it's, a, it's, it's more than a minor point because uh, if, if adults set low expectations for kids, they rise to those low expectations. If adults set high expectations for kids, they rise to those high expectations. And that starts at the very top with the leaders, the, um, uh, the, the governing body of the school district. All right, so this governing body that you all are going to appoint, you're going to interview people? Yes. And uh, what are you looking for? Well, I mean, as I said before, the, the first characteristic, the most important characteristic is, do you believe all children can learn? Um, and not, you know, all children except those in special education, or not children except those that might come to school hungry. No, no, we are going to find a way to support every one of our students. You have to be relentless in your mindset on that. Beyond that, um, you know, we want people that understand the role uh, that governance uh, plays as opposed to management. You're there to um, set a big picture goals and to monitor goals and to, and to ensure that your, your district leadership team is remaining focused on uh, supporting those goals for kids. And these are not like abstract concepts. A goal could be like we want to ensure that every one of our kids has a meaningful extracurricular activity. I, I have a, so I have a question. Once you appoint these folks, will it be the, the same amount of board members that are currently there and will the managers have the same amount of responsibility of responsiveness to the community? So in other words, you've got nine district members now. Mm -hmm. Will you appoint nine managers? And so if I live in district one, will there be a manager that's responsible for communicating with the parents and getting that community involved? Or will they be purely district focused? So there will be nine board members. We are, uh, so we're, we're uh, trying to, to choose a group of people that uh, believe in kids, that have the, the discipline to do the job, that are comfortable with big numbers and big systems, um, uh, that also, you know, as you all know, being in the media, have you know, thick skins. Uh, but um, uh, one of the things that's also important to realize is that while they will serve a, a diverse constituency base in Houston, um, their job is to ensure that all 210,000 kids in Houston are moving forward. It, it, it does mean no good to know that um, Yates gets better and Kashmir gets worse. They all have to move forward. They all have to get better. We have to support every one of our kids. I think sometimes um, uh, the, the political system that we have for school board members can create this balkanization um, that I'm no longer going to think about the sum of Houston ISD and what is important for all of our kids. I'm only going to care about the kids in these schools. And um, that is not the right role for Does a school board Does that mean we member. need at large members too? Well, I mean, this is something for Houstonians, I think, themselves uh, to, to, um, to decide. I, I have seen successful school boards with um, uh, exclusively single member districts. I've seen successful school boards with exclusively at large districts. I think it's, it's all subject to the, um, the local political culture um, uh, of, of the city. How, how, did we, how did we get to this point? Uh, is, you're talking about the takeover. Right. Ultimately, we got to this point because the, um, the board exhibited a pretty extraordinary level of dysfunction. And it allowed, uh, as a result of that, it allowed through resource allocation decisions, through a lack of leadership focus, um, pockets of underperformance to metastasize. I mean, just keep it real. This is, um, I mean, we've got, there were, there were 13, at one point in time, there were 13 People campuses, there were 13 campuses that had failed four consecutive years in Houston ISD. And nothing was changing. And, no, and nothing was changing. And this is, this, you know, the, the uh, when do we say enough is enough? When, when do we say, uh, uh, yes, those might not me be, those might not be my biological children in that campus, but it doesn't matter. I want them to get the same thing that my own kids get. Well, you're the critics of this action, and that includes the HISD who filed suit to stop you from taking over. I guess their message is, we ain't at the point where it's too much. 
your attitude, of course, is any children that have been left behind is inexcusable and that this school board and the school leadership at HISD over the last number of years has let this happen and doesn't at the end of the day really care about children because if they did, they wouldn't let it happen. That's kind of what the yeah, message I, don't, I, don't, I read. I don't like to go so far as to say they don't care about children. We got a lot of hardworking people, and nobody runs for the school board because they want bad things to happen to kids. Right. Um, these, these, in many cases, could be otherwise, uh, you know, uh, good people that were trying to do good things. Just don't belong on a school the, board. The system that they collectively formed did not work. Okay, is HISD as a school district too large, too unwieldy? Uh, I mean, scale is, scale is a challenge in any organization. You can talk to any leader that um, uh, the, the way you create a culture of uh, servant leadership and innovation uh, is sometimes difficult the bigger and bigger things get. That being said, with the right systems level choices that are made at the top to, to drive change, large school districts can still remain very effective for their kids. You, you think about um, Houston ISD has well over 10,000, I think 12,000 uh, rough, uh, roughly teachers. The question is, is how are we supporting them as a system? Like our approach to recruiting, um, uh, our approach to onboarding and training when they come in, uh, 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 our, our work to create uh, financial incentives to support, say, higher levels of compensation at some schools, higher levels of compensation in some fields and some disciplines. Um, the work to, to create uh, continuous improvement support for those teachers so they get better and better and better. Um, those are big levers that need to be pulled um, from the top to support the entire system of schools in Houston. And so at, at scale, yes, that it can be daunting, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, how long? Um, I think that's another question that's, that's lingering is how long does the Board of Managers um, stay in place? And how do you get back to, and, and once that time comes, how do you get back to a regularly elected board? I heard you in a talk and you, and you, um, you made a, a, a comment, I appreciate it, uh, where you stated, you know, this really is a conflict between our democratic values Right, and our values of educating our children, and right, which one and wins. which one wins in times like that, right? And so we, you've taken the step to say that our children win. How do you go back to that democratic, those democratic values? So we've got to go back to an elected uh, board in Houston as quickly as is possible. Um, the, uh, but we also want to ensure that the underlying conditions that got us to this point have been substantively resolved. So um, uh, legally, we're actually not allowed to begin the process to, to go back to electoral control until um, the individual campus that uh, pulled us in meets standard two years in a row. So I think Wheatley High Schools need to, need to get a C two years in a row. Um, broadly speaking, what I would like to see is no more multi-year F campuses in Houston, period. Um, uh, if, if you have one off year, you have one off year, but you need to have a system that resolves that so, so that our children get the support that they need. So um, uh, I, I hope that that can happen as quickly as possible. When, uh, just as a procedural matter, when we do pull the trigger to go back to electoral control, there's actually a slow release process that um, over the course of a, um, two years, a third of the board rolls off, third rolls on, and so on. So it, um, that, so there'll that, be a transition. There, there's a transition so to ensure that the, uh, the newly elected board um, sort of follows the same culture of, of servant leadership that has been established by the board of managers. So, because there are four new board members now. Yeah, they're going to be out. So they'll be, they'll, they won't roll back on. Uh, they could potentially roll back. Depending it just depends, on, depends on how quickly we um, um, get up to standard. Yeah, we, but you we, have to have you have to get through at least the school year so you can evaluate how the students two of them. are doing. Well, and it's also important we haven't started yet. Yeah, uh, there's, there's been a lot of media coverage about this, but the board of managers has not yet been put in place. Right. So um, until that happens, we're we're, we're uh, it's it's still academic in terms of what we're talking about. That's true. Uh, I want to ask you in, in looking at the state of Texas overall, do we have a dropout problem in Texas in high school? So the graduation rate, uh, the four-year graduation rate in Texas is 90%. It is the highest it's ever been. It is in top five of all states in the country, which is an especially um, impressive statistic when you consider That's that 60% right. of kids in Texas schools um, need federal support to ensure that they eat meals on a daily basis. And the, the level of, say, student poverty 
in all of the other states that are in the top five is no more than half of what you see in Texas. So our educators all over the state of Texas have been moving mountains for children. It's a phenomenal success story. Um, that being said, we're still not at 100%, so we still have um, room to improve. We've got about one minute left, so we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll leave it with this. You know, when, when Commissioner Mike Murat decides that he's going to say bye-bye to the TEA, <laughs> what would you have liked to see as your legacy? I want to see, um, I want to see much uh, higher outcomes for our kids. I mean, we do this work to give our kids the best possible chance at success in this country. That means their level of literacy, their math skills, their, um, even their broad skills as humans. I mean, we, we need to love one another. Uh, this, is, this is the work of public education. So I want to see all of, um, all of those meaningful indicators for, that are important to our kids in, um, have increased dramatically, especially for um, students from low-income families. Thank, thank you for your work here in Texas and, and to our children. Yeah, and we hope that you'll get a chance to uh, get your board of managers in place in HISD so you can start repairing the broken district. Well, thank you very much. This has been another episode of Red, White, and Blue. I am Dallas Jones from the left. Gary Pollan from the right. We'll see you next week.